Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Virginia. Listen up. Win Bet is now live in all these states, and the excitement of Win Las Vegas has finally landed in online sports betting and casino play. From boosted parlays to live in game offs on every major sport, Win Bet gives you the tools to win. Sign up today for your risk free $1,000 sports bet. Download the Win Bet app now or visit wynnbet.com to start winning. You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. It's the Huddle Up Podcast, presented as always by Mile High Huddle, powered by Blue Wire Pods. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, is with, and with me is my fellow football priest, who you know, who you love, as the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach, you were pretty uh, open and upfront on Twitter when our great <laughs> listeners and followers would ask you about Jalen Smith. Yeah. He's since been scooped up by the Green Bay Packers, but... Explain to the listeners why that may have been a pretty solid bullet the Broncos may have dodged. Well, first of all, people were saying that he was a, um, he can even be at worst a depth piece for the Broncos defense. And if you've watched any film of Jalen Smith, you'd realize he has nothing left after that knee injury. He literally cannot move laterally. Go on Twitter, go on video, and type in Jalen Smith, and you'll see the plays that he did not make because he he cannot move anymore. The Broncos already have a Jalen Smith on the roster. His name is Alexander Johnson. The thing about AJ, though, he is about 10 times more dynamic and 10 times more athletic, and that's saying a lot because he's not that great in pass coverage. They didn't need Jalen Smith. A lot of Broncos fans just recognized his name. They recognized his career at Notre Dame, that catastrophic injury he overcame, and it's the name cachet and the name value, and they wanted to pounce on him. They, When they picked up Avery Williamson, I think that was a pretty clear indication they weren't going to go after another linebacker, and why would you take those reps away from the younger players you have in Cernod, who's receiving invaluable starting experience right now, and also Baron Browning, who opened the season kind of behind the eight ball, but he has meteoric upside, Chad. I mean, that could be a future pro bowler in the making. So they didn't need Jalen. He was going to offer nothing they didn't already have and nothing they needed. They don't need need leadership at that position. They have that in AJ. They don't need a run stopper. They have that in AJ. Uh, they They needed what they have which is the youth movement, which is getting the younger players involved. I like the Williamson pickup, if only because what's his forte? Pass coverage. It's the one thing they can't do collectively just yet. They're not included. So I like that pickup. Very low cost, high reward signing potentially. But Jalen Smith, he would have given the Broncos nothing. That guy is shot. I think one of the, the ways you explained it that probably makes the most sense to people is the fact that why do you want Jalen Smith when you have Alexander Johnson? And you're not just talking about, and I'll say we, I'm going to include myself on this, we're not just talking about uh, you already have a starting linebacker or a veteran linebacker. They're very much very similar in terms of their play style, productivity, difference being much less wear and tear on Alexander Johnson. And Johnson has been playing at a pretty high level. Similar guys in terms of run fit, big, strong, long guys, um, not the best in coverage, but you already have that in Alexander Johnson. So if you're going to go out and try and find a linebacker with some veteran experience and wherewithal, you want to check a box that you currently don't have right now, as far as veteran experience is concerned. And that's a guy with a little speed. When Avery Williamson entered the league, he was clocked at a four, six, six, uh, 40, which, you know, it's not like blow your socks off fast, but for a linebacker, Zach, that's fast. And so, it's going to take a little time to get Williamson up to speed, obviously, but as a veteran, probably not as long as you might think. He's on the practice right. squad currently, but he's only going to be there a short time, I, I can promise you. This is a guy that is like, if you play 16, you're getting 100-plus tackles, period, end of story. Like Even last year when he was uh, playing for two different teams, Zach, he still ended up clocking over 100 tackles for the season, and he spent about half and half with those two teams, so... I'm actually really geeked up about the possibility of Avery Williamson being something in Denver. 
I know he's been languishing. He's been kind of sitting around for a while, but he's in shape. You got to get into football shape, though, Zach. And I think that's going to be the biggest uh, buffering time that it's going to take before fans read the headline, Broncos sign Avery Williamson, and then finally see him on the field. Listen up, Broncos country. Tick Pick should be your first choice to buy football tickets because they save fans money by never charging any service fees ever. Tick Pick is the exclusive ticketing partner for the Huddle Up podcast and the Blue Wire Network. Denver Broncos football is finally back, and there's no need to exhaust yourself searching all over the internet to find Broncos tickets anymore. Because Tick Pick, that's T I C K P I C K, is the original no fee ticket site and the only one you'll ever need as your go to for all NFL tickets. Tick Pick got rid of all those awful service fees that the other ticket sites charge, which lets them guarantee the best prices on all of their NFL tickets. Don't believe it? If you can find Find better prices for the same seats on another ticket site. Tick Pick will give you 110% of the difference in the purchase price. That's right, guys. When we were searching for tickets for the MHH meet and greet for week three at home, Broncos versus Jets, Tick Pick had us locked down. So visit TickPick.com slash huddle today and use the promo code huddle to save $10 on your first order of Broncos tickets. I'm, I'm not gonna. I, there's a follower I have and a, and a, and a, a viewer, to, a longtime viewer of the podcast. I'm not gonna put him on blast, but he kind of debated with me on Twitter the merit of signing Jalen Smith, the fact that he's uh, receiving more snaps, the fact that he graded out so far as the number 11 overall linebacker according to PFF, with an overall grade by the way of 69.5. It's all relative. Uh, he, and, and this follower also cited Jalen once running a 4-4. He's not running anywhere near a 4-4 any longer, and the only reason he's sne- seeing increased snaps is because the Cowboys lost their starting linebacker to the CV list. I still don't want to say the word. So that's the only reason they had to play him. And when they got the linebacker back, Keanu Neal, from the, from the CV list, which was today, coincidentally or not, Chad, they decided to release Jalen Smith finally. So... It's it's he's an older player. I know he's 26, but he might as well be 36 in terms of football years and wear and tear on his tires. Williamson, I think, is a higher upside signing, a practice squad guy. No, no, you know, no skin off the Broncos' nose if it doesn't work out. He he doesn't perform well. You cut him, but at least what he brings to the table is something the Broncos don't already have. What Jalen Smith yep. would have brought or lack thereof, the Broncos already have in spades. And you probably would have had to have paid him decent. I mean, I don't know if the details yet have come out on what he's agreed to with the Packers, but I promise you it's more than what Avery Williamson was able to get from the Broncos signing to the practice squad. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to talk about this real quick before we get to some matters of business. Zach, let's grab Christian Super Chat because he's been waiting like a patient boy, and we want to reward that. Good things come to those who wait. Christian wants to know, and thank you for that Super Chat, my friend. He says, does Dalton Reisner not fit? Mike Munchak's blocking scheme, after all. Zach, this is interesting because it's important to remember that um, Dalton Reisner, despite being kind of an Iron Man the first two years he was with the Broncos, started all 32 games, he was drafted to a Mike Munchak regime, right? So Mike Munchak was here. He was hired after he, you know, came basically runner up to Vic Fangio for the head coach job. He decided to stick around because. He's got grandkids in the area. That was part of the allure for putting his hat in the ring for the Broncos job. Fangio kept him as an O-line coach, and what a what a get that was, ostensibly, because Munchak is viewed as one of the top two or three O-line coaches in the league. Dalton Reisner, though, Zach, was a career right tackle at Kansas State. They liked him as an interior guy. Fine, yeah. whatever. You trust the expertise, I guess, of uh, Mike Munchak. It hasn't come out in the wash each year. You know, Reisner has flashed here and there, but that consistency component that you're looking for as far as play on the field has been absent. And this year he has shown, I just, there's no way around it. Just got to say it, alarming signs of regression. And I know, look, I'm not going to try and bill myself to you guys as some kind of trench expert. I'm not, I don't pretend to be that. Okay. Eric Trickle though, I trust what he says, all the film study he does, all that he knows about football in the trenches, Zach. He is straight up about this. If you guys have been watching his and reading his film breakdowns of the Broncos O-line through this first quarter of the season, he's like, look, Reisner just isn't a fit for Munchak. There's really no other explanation at this point. 
It very well could be, but it's not just Reisner that's underperforming, especially lately. The entire interior offensive line, including Cushenberry, uh, including Glasgow, uh, and even Bobby Massey was whipped for a sack last week, and, and Garrett Bowles had his worst game in probably two seasons. He looks like he's regressing just a little bit after getting that big contract. So I'm not going to say it's a coaching issue with Munchak. Obviously, I think he's demonstrated to be one of the best guys, if not the best OL coach in the league. It could be a talent issue with Reisner. It might just not be a, a, an ideal fit at left guard. You wonder maybe at right guard, would he be better? Would that not make much of a difference? Is he not a guard? Is he a center? Is he a tackle? All these questions we're still wondering about him, and that's the frustrating part because after 2019, Broncos country thought they had a long-time linchpin at left guard in Dalton Reisner, and he fit the bill with his play, with his personality, and he's taken a couple steps back. But in his defense... A lot of players have taken steps back on the offensive line, which is disturbing. You know, Munchak's shining success story, like if he would have retired at the end of last year, as far as his two-year tenure in Denver, would have been Garrett Bowles turning the corner, right? And I think Munchak deserves a lot of credit for that. And oddly enough, I think Dalton Reisner actually deserves some of the credit. I mean, most of it goes to Bowles, as it should. He's the one that put in the effort and the work and, you know, got the live bullet experience to really turn the corner. But Dalton Reisner, man, really helped keep this dude from the brink of despair for a long time. From the time he was a rookie, he, in fact, Zach, if you can remember in 2019, a lot of Dalton's pressers, he'd get asked about the struggling Bulls and all that because that's who he's playing next to. You got a first round pick and a second round pick playing right next to each other. And after, you know, a couple weeks into the season, he started talking and he would just say, hey, look, I know it's weird because I'm the rookie and I'm kind of the younger guy relative to Garrett. But like, I feel like I've kind of taken on a big brother role to him. So he very much mentored him from a headspace perspective, from a giving him confidence, keep your chin up, that kind of thing. And it really made a difference. But uh, we'll, we'll get to, to more of this stuff, guys. I see a lot of stuff stacking well, up in the chat. You also have to wonder, Chad, does that go into it? I mean, given how incompetent Pat Shermer has looked and how he's a downgrade for every all 11 players on the field, quarterback included, you wonder if there was a better offensive coordinator at the controls with the offensive line and particularly would Dalton Reisner be playing better? It's hypothetical, but one worth wondering. Now, this question about, well, is it Mike Munchak's scheme? Is it Shermer's scheme? I don't know. It it. it I'm not 100% sure, but usually, like if you go back to the Mike Shanahan era and Alex Gibbs, Mike Shanahan's offense, actually, let me put it this way. Mike Shanahan uh, wove the Alex Gibbs blocking scheme into his offense. So I would assume it's the same way. Whatever your guy's comfortable with, that's probably what you're rolling with, especially if it's Mike Munchak and you're Pat Shermer. You know what I just thought of, though? I mean, coinciding with Drew Locke going 4-1 and in 2019 and also Dalton Reisner playing his best ball to date so far in 2019, different coordinator, mm -hmm. which was Rich Scangarello. So it's, again, you, you wonder how much Pat Shermer indirectly or directly is holding back some of these players on offense. We'll grab that super chat one second here, guys, before we get too much farther into tonight's show. Some quick matters of business. Just want to give everyone an update on where we stand six days into the month of October on this month's goal on Facebook. Once again, 250K stars. When we reach it, I'm going to use the assumptive there. We're going to raffle off a Patrick Sertan jersey. All right. And the people in the running for that raffle are only those who have contributed to the goal. And as you can see, we are at 8%. So what that means is, you know, we're behind the eight ball because we're about 20% into the month as far as the days, right? So we got some ground to make up if we're going to do a raffle at the end of this month. And here's just so everyone can see where we're at. Here's who is at the top as far as having the most tickets in the hat. Uh, Mama Muti at the top. We love you. Lawrence Rivera right there at two. Randy Jones. You got a little something coming your way, by the way, Randy, at three. And let me know when you get your hat. Same to you, Michael, at four. Josh Shadow at five. Andrew Baker at six. Uh, Travis Weber at seven, Tim Hoffman, eight, David Wilder, nine, Pete Middleton at 10. All right. So that's who's going to have the most tickets at the hat up to this point, but we still have a long row left to hoe. And then tomorrow we'll have updated super chat uh, rankings because we're going to do the same thing as we did last month. We will raffle off a Patrick Sertan jersey to the top five finishers on super chat in the month of October. All right. John Figueroa, J Fig, as I like to call him affectionately. Appreciate that, brother. He says, I think we win with Drew this weekend if Teddy can't start. Run the ball, play good defense, that's it. Go Broncos. Hey, 
you better telegraph that to Pat as far as the whole <laughs> run the ball thing, Jay Fig, because he he didn't get the memo last week. But hey, I, I got to tell you, if it ends up being Drew, I don't feel too good about the Denver Broncos. I know this is a listing uh, Pittsburgh Steelers ship. Right but there with you. Based on the way the team responded when Drew took the field, and Drew didn't play well himself. I mean, even Vic said today, you know, Drew's below average is the word, the phrasing he used, uh, performance. He said, basically, I'll interpret, I'll read between the lines here, as much a symptom of the collective, the way the offense was playing that day as anything. So um, we'll see, my friend. Ben Brothersberger, though, the rumors of his demise, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> I think I am, but about Pat Shermer, I mean, even if he got the memo, would it make a difference? I mean, you can scream in his face. You have to run the ball. You have two really good running backs and an erratic quarterback. I don't think he'd still do it. He didn't last week. Five rushing attempts in the second half. Nuff said on that. I'm right there with you, though. I think Teddy Bridgewater playing in this game, the Broncos win, and maybe fairly handily. Steelers still have a good defense, but I do not like or I am confident at all in that, in that Ben Roethlisberger-led offense. He is... More of a statue than Joe Flacco ever was. I mean, you even you can just walk around the offensive line. You can get to him. So this could be a huge game for Von Miller, a huge game for the front seven. I have no concerns with the Denver defense. It's the Denver offense. And I still think they could win with Locke, but they'd have to hide him a lot. They'd have to mask his deficiencies. And I don't trust Pat Shermer to do that either, unless they get two huge rushing efforts by Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon, who didn't practice today because he's a little beat up. Tough position for the Broncos to be in. It's looking like Teddy could practice on a limited basis in the very near future. And him even having, I think, one limited practice and then gaining that independent clearance from a neurologist would make him eligible to suit up on Sunday. And if he does, I do like the Broncos' chances. Michaela, <clears throat> pardon me, Michaela, the Dutch is jumping in. Frog in my throat. Pardon me one second. There we go. Uh, good to see you. Love you. Appreciate you. Still uh, rocking the hat in the profile pic like a boss. She's congratulating Jay on having a new baby. Hashtag collection for new baby Bronco gear. Well, Jay, congrats, dude. That is awesome. That's awesome, my friend. There's nothing like it being a new dad. Just had one myself in May. Theodore Jensen. So congrats, bro. HuddleUpPod.com. Get your Broncos onesie now. There is one there. Yep, there is. And Travis Weber jumping in. Good to see you as well, my friend. Appreciate the stars, all your support. Really do. And let me know. Uh, when you get your hat, it should be there by now. I would think if not sometime this week, it should be there. Um, he says, I've seen Ronald Darby is off the injured reserve and Teddy is at least attending meetings, which is a good sign. Is Jerry Judy really going to come back sooner than expected? And what is the word on Reisner in Glasgow? Well, um, basically what Fangio said today about Judy is that his initial timetable, Zach, six to eight weeks, and he said so far, especially the last week or so, Judy has made up a lot of ground in his uh, rehab. And so it's looking like I was waiting for him to say, so, you know, we might be able to get him back here in the next couple of weeks. But instead, what he said was he's looking like it's going to be closer to the six as opposed to the eight. So if we put that in a literal real time frame, he was injured in week one, right? It was week one. Yeah, week seven. So you, you might get him. Week eight is what I would say is your best case scenario because week two, one, week week three, four, five, six, seven, there's there's your six, and then week eight. It would be the very soonest you could circle him. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, based on the way Fangio was talking, it could be week seven, but I think they would you know defer to the side of caution and hold him out one more week. Uh, he's looking pretty good. Uh, Reisner, uh, I, I saw he gave some interview where he you know declared he'll be back on the field. Glasgow still seems a little further away, but I do think they'll have Reisner. I didn't see the other player that they were asking about in terms of injuries. Uh, Glasgow. Uh, and Teddy, yeah, Teddy is attending meetings, uh, and, and Vic Fangio said uh, he's still going through the concussion protocol, which is a multi-stage, multi-pronged process. Uh, he has to have independent clearance from a neurologist to suit up on Sunday, but he's attending meetings, and Fangio cracked the door for him to practice on, on a limited basis probably Friday. And if he does that, it's looking good for his status. And by the way, Darby, it's no guarantee he's returning to the field this week, in fact, as he, uh, what to quote Fangio, he said, we'll see. There are a lot of moving parts there. One, is Darby ready to play? And two, Patrick Sertan's health. It's really too early to give you an answer in terms of Ronald Darby playing for sure and what role that would give Patrick Sertan if indeed 
he's healthy enough to contribute. Uh, Howie freaking day. What's good, buddy. Good to see you. Have you got your, uh, your Jersey yet? If so, let us know. He says, do you guys think the coaching staff will make it through the season? And do you think they deserve to, if they get fired, who would you pick to replace them? So my thing on this Zach, and then I'm going to serve it over to you is we said from the beginning this year that, you know, this is it for Fangio. This is the, you know, like general Custer, this is his last stand. Hopefully, you know, he's a little bit more successful in his last stand. But if he's not, this is it. Now, will he be fired in season? I don't know if George Payton's really that so. guy. I think he'll probably ride it out, make him a Black Monday casualty, et cetera. Uh, okay, good to know. I'll check that tracking number. I sent you the tracking number, right, Howie? Let me. I'll, I'll double check that after the show. But either way, um, on Fangio, Zach, it's – look, fans were riding high, 3-0. and you took a step back, losing to a high-quality playoff team, and now fans are going, when is Fangio getting fired? And it's not. I'm not trying to make light of your concerns, Howie, because we're concerned too, trust. But it's just too soon to start um, knee-jerking, saying, get Fangio out of there. we got to see how and if they can rebound from that step back. Yeah, but you know, you you wonder was the three and an O start a mirage or is the last week's loss a mirage? I think right. one of those two is. And if Fangio keeps proving himself to be the head coach of his caliber, which is not that great, he's going to get his walking papers on Black Monday. To answer the question more directly, I, it would take a catastrophic Urban Meyer like. Uh, disaster in Denver for Fangio to be fired in season. I think ultimately George Payton professes, professes patience, tough phrase to turn, and I think he's going to wait until after the year to make a decision. Uh, but anything short of a playoff berth, and now especially after starting three and one, I mean more pressure is on Fangio now to keep that going and prove it wasn't a fluke. But anything short of that, I think, and I think Payton will be ready to move on and get his own guy in the building. And my preferred candidate, far and away, I would love Brian Dayball. I would love Greg Roman. I would love any young up and coming offensive mind. But right now, Kellen Moore is my guy. I would give up, maybe not the entire farm, but a lot of things on the farm to get Kellen Moore in Denver. And that means something, guys, because one of Zach's NFL jobs is covering the Dallas Cowboys, as most of you know. And so he's had a chance to really see up close how this cat operates. And if you're paying attention, he's a pretty savvy, creative, kind of cutting edge coordinator. He's very young. Very. But hey, look, Sean McVay, right? What was right. he, 30, 30? I think he was 30. 30. I think he beat Josh McDaniels, I think, was the youngest head coach of the modern era hired. And thank you for the super sticker, Mo. Hope baby Malik's doing well. Looks like, uh, yeah, looks like he's in your profile pic. Very cute, my friend. Appreciate you. Kellen Moore is everything that Pat Shermer isn't. And it's so refreshing to watch that on a weekly basis when you contrast it with Denver. Helps having a franchise quarterback, but just his concepts and his play calling and the fact that they can win on the strength of Kellen Moore's brain is just a, it's a foreign experience for me to watch, John. Very much like the Boise State Broncos of old, living and dying by the brain of uh, Kellen Moore, not so much the left arm. I almost went right arm, left arm. He was a southpaw. Uh, Clint, good evening, fellas. I haven't been around in months. Just found out I have cancer along with other medical conditions, but I'm back at least for now. Hey, Clint, dude, thank you for letting us know. And uh, wow, let's I'm collectively sorry, as a community put some positivity into the universe for Clint. Thoughts, prayers, people yeah. uh, talk about that. Like, you know, if you're ever on Twitter and a tragedy happens and people start tweeting thoughts and prayers, the immediate backlash is, oh, like that's going to do anything. Let me tell you something. It, it is. Works. Even if you don't believe in uh, higher power, the there is such a thing as, as um, uh, I guess I don't want to derail this podcast too much into the, into the weeds here, but bottom line is this. It matters. It makes a difference. Positivity, energy, all that stuff. So prayers up. We'll keep you in our thoughts and prayers, Clint. If there's anything we can do to help out, let us know. Yeah, Clint, I will be praying for you tonight. And and please feel free to reach out, milehighhuddle at gmail.com. Let us know if we can do anything. Thank you for sharing with us. Keep a stiff upper lip, my friend. Uh, easier said than done, I know, but you can do it. Here is uh, DeAndre. What's good, DeAndre? Aloha, guys. On to the Steelers, better execution on both sides of the ball and all three phases. Yes, indeed. The Steelers are interesting. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the message that I heard from all the defenders today that were at the podium were, hey, what do you make of the, you know, apparent demise of Ben Roethlisberger and all this and that? And, you know, is he done type thing? Or how do you account for the Steelers offense? 
And they just said, look, yeah, whatever. They acknowledged they haven't been playing that well, or at least what you're used to seeing from a Big Ben-led Steelers offense. But their focus is we don't want him – that if he's going to turn the corner, we don't want that turning the corner moment to come against us. Yeah, couldn't imagine how hard Fangio would be slamming down his headset, chat if Big Ben goes off. Uh, they have a pre- pretty formidable offense on paper. They have some really good receivers. They have Najee Harris, who's looking really good at running back. But the offensive line in Pittsburgh is pretty dreadful. Big Ben needs to retire yesterday. I think he's cooked for sure. So it should be an easier game on Denver's defense. But it could come down, like I talked last week, Chad, to coaching. And and Mike Tomlin is one of the most underrated coaches in NFL history, and I think he's one of the best in NFL history. And you match his wits against Pat, uh, against Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer, for that matter, that's where the difference in a game could come, and you saw it last week against Baltimore, among other things. He was also really, really good uh, in the program as the running back, if you can remember that. Oh, wait, no, that was Omar Epps, his doppelganger. <laughs> My bad. Uh Casey Nickel, what's going on? Good to see you, bro. Appreciate the super. I'm Since pitching t- in here. Time to start buying some billboards. Yes, Welcome, sir. Kellen Moore to Mile <laughs> High. Talk about uh, the power of positive thinking and willing something into existence, Zach. That's that's one way to do it. Dennis wants to know about the status of Michael O.J. Moody. Um, I can. I'm trying to think. I don't Who? think they talked about him today. <laughs> I forgot that he existed. No, I, th- you know, I think they're bringing him back slowly because up until this point they could have weathered um, him being on the sideline. But now Sertan is hurt. Obviously, Darby is coming back from injury, so I think the onus and the pressure is on to get Michael O back into the fold. I don't know if he's coming back this week though. No, he's definitely not. They did discuss Vic Fangio did anyway. Isang Basi today, um, who's coming back off an ACL suffered halfway through last year. He said of Bassey that. Um, he's ready to go whenever they need to bring him up basically. And, but he has to, he has to sit out the first six games cause he was a pup guy. He was physically unable to perform and those guys have to go uh, six weeks before you can activate. Um, so we, we have a little bit better beat on where Bassey's at, but it's been mum on Michael O. Yeah. What does that say? Indeed. Kayaka in the house. What's up brother? Hey, by the way, I haven't sent out the program. I, uh, just, I keep forgetting, dude. So I'll get that out here this week. I promise. He says, Aloha, brothers and Broncos country. Sorry, I'm late. There were two <laughs> linebackers I had hoped we'd sign, Eric Wilson and Avery Williamson. We got the latter, and I'm here for it. So happy we did not get Jalen Smith. No, thank you. So Kayaka's stoked on Avery Williamson, Zach, and I think there's a lot of good reason to be stoked. As you kind of respond to Kayaka here, I'm going to bring up his career statistics so people can get a bead for inexplicably why this dude was chilling out there. I don't know, but productive cat. Well, this reminded me of the drum I was beating the entire offseason. Today would be a great day to sign Eric Wilson. That was one of my top offseason targets. Unfortunately, Philadelphia got to him, and I was watching the highlights from the Eagles game last week, and sure enough, he came up with a turnover. The guy is just incredible in that aspect. But I'm right there with you on Williamson. I believe in the past I advocated for the Broncos to sniff around him, if only because, again, his 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 prowess and pass coverage. It's the one thing the Broncos have lacked since Danny Trevathan at inside linebacker. They tried everything and every one to combat that Achilles heel, and nothing has worked. So even on a limited basis, even on a, a bit role type contributor status of Avery Williamson, get him in on passing downs. If he can disrupt one tight end pass, one running back pass, make a difference on one third down, it's worth it for me. So he entered the league in 14 as a mid-round pick out of Kentucky with the Tennessee Titans, and he was a starter as a rookie, but 2015 was the year he was a starter from the drop. And, I mean, if you look at this, all right, let's just – I mean, even as a rookie, he gave he gave the Titans 78 tackles and three sacks, uh, multiple passes defensed, you know, breaking them up, multiple QB hits, tackles for a loss and all that. But look at this from 15 through – I'm just going to say all the way through till the present. All right. In 2015, 102 tackles, 16, 104 tackles, 17, 92 tackles. And then he leaves Tennessee. He's an unrestricted free agent. The Jets pay him something like three years, 22 million, I think, something like that. And he goes on to produce what I think was a Pro Bowl year. He got snubbed, 120 tackles, three sacks, Zach. And then look at this six tackles for a loss, 
four QB hits. It keeps but, coming. A fumble recovery, two forced fumbles, six pass right breakups. There. Yep. And a pick. This dude then um, was tra- – well, he got injured in 2019, if I remember right. Yeah, he tore his ACL 2019 before the season started in the preseason. And then last year, he uh, played for the Jets and the Steelers. And look, he still totaled – in 15 games, he totaled north of 100 tackles. This dude is legit. Ironic or not, the Broncos would sign a former Steelers linebacker days before they play Pittsburgh – but, you know, you're getting this guy on your practice squad. You're, all that experience, all that production, and what a deal for Denver. You don't have to thrust him into a starting role. If Sernod falls on his face or continues to, then you have Williamson that can come in and not only provide starters experience, but again, he's adept at, adept at guarding the pass. So maybe as the, the counterpart to AJ, who's more of a run defender, maybe Williamson could be the guy, Chad. I'm really excited about him, if you guys couldn't tell. Like, he's really intriguing to me. Quick shout-out to the great star senders of ours on Facebook today. This is how the board is shaking out for the rankings on this stream. Howie freaking day at the top. Josh Hoyle, thank you. Uh, really appreciate that, Josh. Andrew Baker right there, very consistent as Andrew. And Gary Leach Palmer and Colby, so consistent. Also, Michael and Travis Weber. This is, I mean, this is the gangs all here almost. Uh, on Facebook. So thanks to each and every one of you. We are keeping an eye out, of course, for any of your comments, questions, topics in the chat. And Zach, before I forget, we have something else to give away tonight. We have a little announcement. We did our random selection for the Apple podcast giveaway for the month of September. If you guys are scratching your heads, wondering, wait, whoa, 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 what's this about? Well, if you uh, can recall, we are raffling off. We kind of went off this for a while, but we're coming back to it. Um, some swag, all right, some MHH swag to those who leave a five-star review on the Huddle Up podcast on Apple Podcasts, all right? So the winner, randomly selected, I'll show you guys here so you can get an eyeball. I don't know who this is. Some of the screen names, we could tell who it was, uh, like Albert, Michaela. Love you guys. Thank you for getting in there and giving us the five stars and taking our call to action. Uh, but Y.O. Colby, not sure for sh- exactly who you are. Maybe it's Colby C. Collier, I don't know, but he says with his five-star review, appreciate you, uh, the number one Broncos podcast, Chad and Zach put on a great pod. They actually care about all their listeners and are very knowledgeable, make it fun to participate. They do giveaways and even a meet and greet at a game this year. So here's what you do while Colby, thank you for that very generous five-star rating. Send us an email, milehighhuddle at gmail.com. We will need to know your T-shirt size and your shipping address, and we will get out a little something-something for you. So thank you, and we're doing that again, guys, in the month of October. So even if you enjoy this pod live with us on Facebook or YouTube or Twitch or Twitter, whatever, if you're an Apple user, just pop on real quick on Apple Pods, find us, Huddle Up Podcast, give us a five-star review. That will automatically enter you into this month's giveaway and, of course, helps your football priest and all the podcasts for what it's worth. It helps us. Helps building the Broncos, Broncos for Breakfast, Dove Valley Deep Divers, and Mile High Insiders. Yeah, Colby, congratulations on that. Thank you for the the great review. And uh, guys, it takes literally two seconds on Apple Podcasts to leave a review and and enter for your chance to win some swag. We want to give it away, and we appreciate your uh, generosity with the reviews. Okay, let me uh, take a look here at something. I want to see. I saw one here that I am having a hard time finding now. Sometimes I have it chilling in the chat, Zach, and then if I click off the tab and come back, yeah, it's it's moved. Michael, appreciate you, bro. You the man. Let us know when you get your swag, okay? Um, and uh, your t- your uh, jersey, it's uh, on the way, but it'll it'll take a little time to to get to you. So just keep that in mind. Um, oh, where did it go, man? Here's, let's just grab this and then I'll find it. Bronco fan 99 wants to know on YouTube, can the Broncos O-line handle the pass rush of Pittsburgh? This is a genuine, legit, bona fide threat because the last time the Broncos went to Pittsburgh, the, I mean, it was Bud Dupree, but never, I mean, Watt was in on that a little bit too, but still they didn't come out of that game with their starting quarterback healthy, right? <laughs> Drew Locke suffered that injured shoulder and, it really was the turning point of the season. We talk about that Garrett Bowles being put on skates thing against the Ravens as the turning point in that game. Well, that was the turning point in the season. 
I still have a little PTSD on that Steelers pass rush. Zach, how do you think they're going to be able to handle that? I mean, isn't that the game that Cortland Sutton went down to? So, I mean, this is a PTSD game. Imagine if Cortland Sutton starts with Drew Locke and they end up, you know, torching the, the Steelers defense. That would be uh, very, very um, ironic. But the thing about the Pittsburgh's pass rush, it's not just the defensive line. It's the linebackers. They also have Devin Bush, who is a missile in the front seven. He's a missile near the line of scrimmage. They have to really game plan to counteract that pass rush. Three-step drops, quick hitters, getting the ball in the playmaker's hands. But again, the question always remains, can Pat Shermer do just that? We don't know. It's a, it's a question for the sages and prophets throughout time. All right, and probably uh, hindsight is the only way we're going to know the answer for sure. But Andrew Baker, appreciate you, bro. He says, let's rally against the Steelers and send out vibes to the universe. That's right. That's right, my friend. Uh, Travis says, I was at the Ravens game. It was confusing as to why they went away from the run. It also seemed like our offense yeah. quit when Teddy got hurt. Absolutely. That was palpable whether you were in the stadium, Zach, or watching on TV. It was very disappointing. I thought that the Broncos had evolved, matured beyond something like that, completely knocking them off their rocker, but it happened nonetheless. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely interesting for sure. Black Knight wants to know, what's the rumor with the new QB signing? It's not really a rumor. Vic Fangio was asked, Zach, I'll let you break this down, but Vic Fangio was asked, hey, would you look at signing a quarterback being that you don't know if you're going to have Teddy this week? Drew, Rippon, are you looking outside the building? You had the story for us, and that's probably what Jeremy's talking about here. Uh, he said, we'll see. This was Monday, so he said, we'll see Wednesday where Teddy's at. They're not going to sign another quarterback. They promoted Brett Rippon to the 53, so technically they have three guys. If Teddy sits out, which it's looking like it's a coin flip right now, they still have Locke and Rippon. And uh, if, if something were to happen, obviously, to one of them, then they would sign a quarterback. But right now, they're not making any moves there. I think they're hoping and banking on Teddy playing on Sunday and Locke and going back to his uh, his backup role. Ed Keating, what's up, buddy? He says, I just got my Williams jersey, Pookie, Javante. This coaching staff needs to go now. Thanks, Chad and Zach. Hey, congrats on your jersey. Um, I still think I'll do respect. Jumping the gun a little bit. Don't freak out yet. Look, Zach and I have been Pat Shermer skeptics since about this time last year. Zach even predating that. I was a little bit more rose-colored when they signed Pat, um, or hired, I should say, Pat, after they had fired Rich Scangarello. But um, we've questioned the whole Pat Shermer thing now for a long time. I would love, Zach, to see how Mike Shula, who, I mean, if you ask me, look, Pat Shermer has more administrative coaching experience NFL wise, because he's been a head coach twice. He's been a coordinator at multiple stops, but Zach, uh, Oh, Michaela saying I got my hoodie. Love it. Awesome. Cool. Uh, that's really good. Send us a, uh, send a, send us a selfie with the hat too. All right. We'll put it on Instagram, but anyway, Zach, uh, Mike Shula though, this guy is the brainchild. Let's not forget of the, Cam Newton, Carolina Panthers offense that took the NFL by storm in 2015, leading to MVP award for Cam. And uh, I'd like to see him do something. I think that's a nice little ace in the hole that Fangio has. Like if he has, if a head has to roll, if there needs to be a scapegoat to buy him, you know, a little window of time in this in season while you still have some playoff hopes alive or whatever, you've got a guy waiting in the wings, but something tells me, Zach, Fangio, if you've gone this far with uh, Tom McMahon, you've gone this far with Shermer, you're probably going to let them, you know, you're going to go down with the ship, so to speak. I'd prefer to see Theo over Pat Shermer as OC at this point, honestly, but at least with Mike Shula, he understands the way the wind is blowing in the NFL. I mean, if he can adapt his offense, even 2015, that was the new age. That's the pass first offense Back then with Cam Newton, he understands that he's younger than Pat Shermer. I think he's more in tune to the modern-day NFL, whereas Pat Shermer is stuck in uh, the old analog mode with the old bunny ears TVs. That's just the type of mentality he brings to the Broncos' offense. It's old. It's stale. He doesn't adjust. Uh, It's like watching a relic of football past, and they don't need that. They need football future, and at least 
hopefully, if given the chance, Mike Shula would offer that. Just an intriguing notion, you know. If they never get a chance to see what he can do, I'm always going to wonder. Positivity going out to Clint from the community. I'm seeing it all up and down the chat. So that's what we're talking about, Clint. And that's why I said I'm glad you told us because you have people that can be pulling for you and putting that positive energy out into the universe or on if you're spiritual, you know, uh, praying, right, to the man upstairs. Sydney, why are the Broncos collecting all these guys on the practice squad but not playing them? I'd have to know for sure who you're talking about because the Broncos have promoted or elevated is the word they use now. Two guys to the active roster from the practice squad each week on game day as, you know, is their prerogative. So I'm not sure exactly who you're speaking to on that, Sydney. They've, they've used everyone from uh, Austin Schlopman to uh, the running back Crockett to, I'm trying to remember who it was the previous weeks, but either way, you know, guys are getting used. Avery Williamson, though, is a guy that can now be um, protected, right? Is it four, I think, that you can protect as an NFL team on the practice squad now, 16-man squad, four of them you can protect, meaning that – because normal rules on the practice squad is, hey, you can have a 10-man practice squad and you can pay them relative peanuts compared to what the minimum NFL salary is for active roster duty, but they are susceptible to an NFL team at any given point coming in and saying, we want to sign you – uh, as long as it's to the active roster and you as a team have no say on that, unless you too want to, if, you know, to avoid losing them, you'll sign them to the active roster like they did with Brett Rippon. But it, now uh, since the, the pandemic, they kind of squeezed those rules a little bit, Zach, you can protect four guys on your practice squad each and every week. I would be stunned if Williamson is not a guy that is protected for the next couple of weeks as they get him up to speed, but I don't expect him to be a guy that is just like a mushroom in the dark on that practice squad, he'll be there exactly long enough, however long it takes to get him up to speed. David Moore was another one. And it just seems like as soon as the Broncos get a player there, uh, they're promoting him. So I'm not sure either what player you're referring to, but ideally the practice squad is a reserve. That's your reserve guys. That's your bench. So to speak that if disaster strikes, or if you need a player due to ineffectiveness, injury, whatever, uh, you can promote that guy. You don't want to pull from that pool too often. That's why you narrow down the 53 and determine the 53 best players. Uh, but it's good to have, again, an inside linebacker with that much starting experience and that level of competency, at least in what he brings to the table on the practice squad, available for the taking if Stranaud doesn't work out, if Baron Browning is still not up to snuff in Fangio's scheme. It's a good insurance policy to have. Jordan on YouTube says, I know Melvin Gordon has been running well, but after Javante carried two guys on his back for 20 yards, I'd love to see him as the bell cow. Well, let me tell you, Jordan, you're going to get your wish. It's just probably not going to be, well, I shouldn't say probably. It wouldn't surprise me if he gets that opportunity in 2021, but only if something knock on wood befalls Melvin Gordon on the health front. But in 2022, it's his backfield. That's it. Like he's the man, but guys, as much as we have, uh, you know, I guess at times we've made fun of Melvin Gordon with the Merlot thing and we never liked that contract, but it is important to understand he's a very accomplished. He's a very good NFL back in all three facets of what it takes to be, to have staying power at the position in this league. So don't, don't sleep on him, dude. He's going to get his, his opportunities as well. And Zach, they just need that interior trio, especially to really start stepping up. And you know what? Quinn Miners, who wasn't perfect, but Eric Trickle's got a film piece on Miners first career start last week against the Ravens coming out either tonight or in the morning. The dude was once again, just like, a breath of fresh air inside. Was it completely flawless? No, but guys, Quinn Miners is a guy to get excited about, which is why, hey, I love Dalton Reisner, the dude. I mean, we've told you guys the story at the Combine, our interactions with him and just the cult of personality that he is, but he's not cutting the mustard on game day and Miners is. So as much as I want to see that personality on the field of Dalton Reisner, I don't want to lose that boss mentality, dude, that Miners has brought in a game and a half. Well, in terms of the running backs, the clock is ticking on Melvin Gordon. The clock started ticking the night the Broncos traded up in the second round for Javante Williams. You don't do that unless you envision a starter and a and a, a short-term and long-term starter. 
Uh, Javante does things that Melvin Gordon, Gordon just can't do. And now Gordon's a little banged up. He missed practice today. Um, he's going through the wear and tear of the season. It might be where, by default, Javante gets that job and he will not relinquish it, similar to how Philip Lindsay took over for Freeman back in 2018. It's just a matter of time, though, before Pookie is the number one guy. And I wanted to see more angry runs, like him dragging guys 20 yards down the field. I mean, it's a joy to watch having that mini Marshawn Lynch in the Broncos backfield. Michael, appreciate you, bro. He says, Teddy Bridgewater will be back soon, Broncos country. Be patient with his return. We need him for the stretch run. I like Broncos, uh, Broncos country vibes here on Mile High Huddle on Facebook. Go Broncos. Yeah, guys, I mean, Teddy will be back. If it's not this week, it will be next week for sure. And then, you know, um, maybe all things are possible for this team once again. And I, I don't want you guys to think that because of one – lackluster half in relief of Teddy that in any way, shape or form, I'm like down on lock as a potential franchise guy. NFL wise. I don't think that's going to come for him in Denver. I think that was, you know, when you move on from a young guy that you drafted once name, another guy, a starter, like, look, how many people come back from that with the same team? There's stories of guys where that happened. They go somewhere else, have a little bit of success, but it's pretty rare. Even then, Drew's time, if it's going to come, probably going to be with another team. But I still have high hopes for this cat. I really do. But it was disappointing to see that back off the back foot throw yeah. pick in the end zone. Like, come on, Drew. When are you going to grow from that? Step up in the pocket, my dog. You know, you, you might take a hit, but you got to step up in the pocket to buy your guys time to develop the route and for you to have the platform with which to deliver the ball with technique. Yeah. You know, I'm not down – or necessarily out on Drew Locke, but I'm a little dispirited because it seems like the Broncos have checked out on Drew Locke. Both the coaching staff and the players, they're just washing their hands. And how do you expect to win with that level of of uh, uh, mind that mindset in the building when you don't support your own quarterback when your receiver is throwing tantrums and your coordinator looks disgusted because Drew Locke came in the game. So I would feel more confident if he had a start, if he was playing, like, let's say, Jacksonville or Detroit, but not against Pittsburgh with that front seven. That's a bad position for the Broncos to be in when they don't believe in Locke, and it seems like Locke also has one foot out the door, perhaps. Tough defense coming off a loss. I'd much prefer Teddy to play in this game if the Broncos want to win. Travis Weber, appreciate you, brother. I get it. The Locke train has derailed, but until Teddy is back... He is the next man up. Locke is. I've seen in multiple groups fans saying that if Locke plays, I'm not watching and this and that. And I understand Locke did this to himself, needs to make the corrections, which seems doubtful. But I believe as long as someone is a Bronco, like him or hate him, you support and root for the team to succeed, ride or die, bleed orange and blue. It's sad fans act like this. Yeah, it's it, guys, the whole locked arrangement syndrome thing, it was it's a real living breathing organism, all right? And it's kind of uh been battled with some antibiotics. I've never literally I've never pronounced antibiotics that way in my life. It's been battled with antibiotics uh and it's you know kind of died off a little bit, but it's starting to come back now and it's very divisive. We hate seeing it. We have spoken out against Locked arrangement syndrome for months now. We're right there with you. That's the correct, I think, mindset. But, hey, anytime you start telling a, someone how to be a fan, man, everybody yeah. gets up on their high horse and soapbox. And blah, 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 blah. But I think it, what Travis said, honestly, goes without saying. I think I'm pronouncing it antibiotics from now on, Chad. It just sounds <laughs> more classy, so I'm rolling. I'm getting on that train. Uh, the thing about Locke, uh, you know, if uh, th- this is the proper mindset to have. Root for the team, not the player. And I feel like if Broncos country can pull for the Paxton Lynch era in 2016 and 2017, they can pull for the Locke era if he's either the backup or forced to start one game against Pittsburgh. Uh, this coming week, but it's unfortunate because the fan base was first down on Drew Locke and out on him, and then the players on the field and then the coaching staff, it just seems like the Locke era is a, a, a thing of the past. Howie wants to know, is there a real speed threat wide out left to grab or sign? I feel like this team needs a burner. Howie, I would tell you to go read the article last week from Lance Sanderson on uh, milehighhuddle.com. He lays out five options. Um you know, there's one you could, there's a couple, two or three that you could maybe put together a trade package. But honestly, there's no one out there 
going to come yeah. close to replicating what you had with KJ, you know? So what you, what right. you sign from that Seahawks receiver, David Moore, probably about as close as you're going to get a quarter of the way into an NFL season. Yeah. I'm going to trade for a guy. So Pat Shermer doesn't use him. I mean, it just makes no sense at all. They have two really good receivers in Sutton and Tim Patrick's. They have um, Jerry Judy coming back fairly soon. They still have Noah fan and Alberto. They have two good running backs and they picked up David Moore to fill that speed gap. But if they don't use him, it doesn't matter anyway. I did see that Anthony Miller was cut by Houston today, and he has Chicago ties to Vic Fangio. He's not much of a burner. He has uh, hands issues, but that's one name that's been floating in Broncos country, at least today. By the way, Kayaka, dude, we got to get you some swag. We we like to um, send out some complimentary merch to our Super Chat superstars who consistently – support us and and keep this content coming for everybody else and kayaka you've been one of the greats man and i'm trying to think back now be- oh no we didn't send you with anything because my merch shipment which featured shirts like this and others that you see me wearing now didn't arrive on time so all i had was the posters and a few little odds and ends so kayaka i have your address for the for the uh, program thing dude let let me send you out you tell me what you want dm me or put it in the chat hat t-shirt whatever let us send you out a little something, something, because this is something we like to do for our, our superstar support. And so appreciate you, bro. Uh, Patrick McCracken, do you think the Broncos should have drafted Devin Bush a few years ago instead of trading down and then taking Noah Fant and getting Drew Locke in the second round? You know, hindsight, Zach, it's always 2020. Right. To this day, though, I still think that, that if you asked me, do you want Noah Fant and Drew Locke or Devin Bush, I'm still taking Noah Fant and Drew Locke. And you also landed Dalton Reisner, a a pick within the lock pick as well. So, I mean, it's three players instead of one. Um, Looking back on it, I I would still prefer the Broncos do what they did. I think that's a to get a potential franchise quarterback in the second round because of that trade was great uh, deal making by John Elway. I do uh, submit, though, that the Broncos should have maybe prioritized inside linebacker earlier in the last couple drafts or free agency, it seems like they've ignored that position for far too long, and now you're seeing what can happen if one of the players goes down. And and we're acting like Josie Jewell was this all-pro. I mean, he was a stable presence, but they never really had that game-changer, so I would have liked to see that guy, whether it's Devin Bush or another player. We have Duke Mondrafon, a newer name that we don't recognize on Super Chat. So, Duke, welcome, thank you, appreciate you. He's got a super sticker with a tripped-out, like, we talk about the acid hippo. This is like the acid granny or something. I don't know what it is, but thank you for that super sticker, Duke. Make sure you connect with us on Twitter. I'm trying to make out what that could be. It's like a – oh, that's as big as the – it'll let me it get It looks it. like a pacifier in a teacup with googly hard eyes and black lipstick. Okay. Appreciate I'm starting you. to trip even now. Yeah, I feel right. it. I can okay, taste guys. purple. <laughs> we uh yeah it almost looks like one of those little troll dolls right um but we uh are running out of time guys we're at 52 minutes almost so any specific topics you want us to get to uh chat let us know put it in the put it in the chat here uh but zach before we go i wanted to know if you saw this story talk about locked arrangement syndrome it's really easy to pile on this cat right oh. now and the nfl is doing it uh, DJ Reader. Now, most fans can remember he was the big hot to trot defensive tackle from the Houston Texans in the 2020 free agent period, who the Broncos really uh, pursued. Fortunately, they let the Bengals pay him whatever it was, thir- north of 13 million a year, if I'm not mistaken. But the Broncos were the runner up, and uh, I don't know why he decided to tell the story now. Zach, right. <laughs> but uh, here's the here's the tweet from Ben Baby Baby Bobby. I don't know. Quote, Bengals uh, tackle DJ Reader, recalling his free agency in 2020, cites a question from his agent when picking the Bengals. Quote, you're going to bet on Joe Burrow or Drew Locke? Close quote. Now, remember, they hadn't drafted Joe yet, but they had the number one pick. Everyone knew they were going to draft Joe Burrow. So does this not just smack of piling on right now, Zach? It's just so random to me. I mean, you play for the Bengals, bro. I like, calm down a little bit. You're you're acting like because you won a few games that you're suddenly a Super Bowl contender. Not with your history. So I, you know, he's entitled to his opinion, Chad. But that's just the overall sentiment 
around the NFL with coaches, with players about Locke, and there's nothing he can do in the meantime in Denver right now to change that. It's unfortunate, but not surprising in the least. Disappointing. Disappointing. I mean, locked arrangement syndrome is not just a fan thing, man. Like, it's an NFL-wide phenomenon. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like Travis Weber was talking about just a few minutes ago. What If Drew Lock comes out in this Pittsburgh game and lights up the Steelers, has a big day, the Broncos win big, most of those same pe- the fans, they're going to be like, oh, you know, that was cool, we got to win, but it came against, a, you know, half-dead Big Ben and – you know, um, he, he, he couldn't do it again or whatever. Like, out would come all of the excuse-making and negative Nancy BS that I still, to this day, I just, I don't know what Drew did. I mean, I would expect this almost from, like, Chad Kelly because Chad Kelly actually committed a true transgression <laughs> against the fans by walking stoned and drunk into someone's <laughs> living room at 1 a.m. on Halloween and getting beaten and chased out the door by a freaking vacuum cleaner. I laugh at But that time. dude's still a legend in the hearts of Broncos country, many of Broncos country. I just, I don't get it. I don't understand it either, Chad, and you're exactly right. I mean, Drew Locke can come out, the Broncos can win, you know, 45 nothing. Drew Locke can have five touchdown passes, and they would still find a way to downplay it, disparage it, and uh, excuse it away. And if any other quarterback, including Bridgewater, did half of that, they'd be building him up as the ultimate um, uh, upgrade on Drew Locke. It's just, that's how it's going to be, though, until Locke gets to change the scenery. He needs that desperately. His future is not in Denver, and I hope for at least for his sake, he can carve out a better reputation elsewhere. We got a, uh, before we hit the hit the door and get on out of here, we got a sup- another super sticker, this time from Nathan Laituala. Laituala, is that how you say it, Nathan? But either way, appreciate you, bro. We have so many great not just listeners, but like supporters and community mavens from Hawaii. Blows my mind. From Kayaka uh, to Dale, D-Dub, uh, 96734, who we got to meet both those guys at the game. Uh, I watched the game with Kayaka. I know Dale watched the game with his great wife, um, Gretchen, and Lance Sanderson and Eric Trickle. I mean, the number of Broncos fans, and I'm guessing, Nathan, just looking at the picture and looking at um, your comments uh, I've seen in the past, Maybe maybe you're not Hawaii. I don't know for sure, but I just, dude, thank you, Nathan, and our Hawaiian community. Love you guys. I can't. I, that's just the creepiest thing. Thank you, guys. Okay, guys, we're about to dip. Claude, you the man. Thank you. Appreciate you. Good to see you. Thank you for all of your stars and support. But, guys, I think that does it. I think we covered all the hot topics for today. Um Zach, if you want to go through the rundown, I'll pull up the uh, how we finished on Facebook. Yes, guys. Thank you for watching us tonight, tuning in with us tonight. This was the Huddle Up Podcast. And until we see you guys next time, tomorrow night, be sure to follow the Huddle Up Pod on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account for all your Broncos news, analysis, rumors, transactions, and film breakdowns at Mile High Huddle. Get it, Chad, on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. Get it myself at Kelberman NFL. Go to huddleuppod.com and get your swag while you're at it. Get yourself, I'm not wearing any right now, but like Chad's wearing, he's the perfect Vanna White for this demonstration. Get yourself a shirt, get yourself a hat, get yourself a hoodie for fall and winter. Everything and anything is in that store. Also, facebook.com slash huddle. Hit that big blue button, become a supporter. Three exclusive shows, Kelberman's Corner, Broncos Book Club, Trickle Zone. We appreciate all your viewership on those programs. Also, facebook.com slash mile high huddle pod like that page and as we mentioned earlier if you haven't already go to apple podcast and leave your football priest as you see in front of you a five-star review for a chance to win some swag each and every month get in on that like yo kobe did but if you can't do any of those things do these three things that take a few seconds subscribe like and share this video and every video you see on the mhh channel helps us grow and reach more broncos fans just like you. Just like you, baby. Howie at the top today, finishing. Appreciate that, my friend. Josh, right behind him. Colby, who we have now since learned is Y.O. Colby. So, cool. My hunch was confirmed. Andrew Baker. Gary Leeds Palmer, the distinguished legendary gentleman himself. Michael Ronquillo. Travis Weber. And Claude Riley jumping in late with some stars. Appreciate each and every one of you. And as Zach said, our weekend content, our premium VIP programming, 
None of our competitors do that. Everyone goes home on Friday. They call it and then, you know, they'll work Sunday evening or afternoon, depending on the game. But we keep it turning seven days a week, not just with these live streams, but with the uh, premium content we produce for our, our Facebook supporters. And we're going to be um, passing that laterally as well to a YouTube membership option here in the near future. Uh, you've heard us mention that a few times. It's not happened yet because when we roll it out, we just want it to be perfect. So uh, in the meantime, though, as Zach mentioned, subscribe, like, share. And for those of you interested in Broncos Book Club, become a supporter of MHH on Facebook because we are starting this week, Slow Getting Up by Nate Jackson. Now, maybe you're not a big reader. That's cool. Get the audio book. Or maybe you don't like to listen to things other than this podcast. All good. I'll explain to you why the book's important. But what's fun about Broncos Book Club is we read the book, we get together, we talk about the book. It's fun. It's geeky. If you're a Broncos football geek, you'll love that podcast. And then you've got the hot takes that hold water from Zach every Sunday uh, with Kelberman's Corner and Eric Trickle doing his deep dive analysis thing on the Trickle Zone. So appreciate those of you who are consistent supporters, paying that five bucks a month to keep the content coming, keep the lights on here at MHH, especially what we're doing on Facebook. So love you guys, Zach. Sign us off, dog. Yes, sir. Chad, have a great night. Take care, guys. And as Michael Ronquillo says here, go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.